so first of all, we're delighted to welcome Jeffrey Higgins and, and Jake Skeets to read for POG. Uh, we'll probably read without intermission. And uh, after we get done with the announcements, Charles, I think, is going to introduce Jeffrey. And then Lisa is going to introduce uh, Jake. And that's, that's the plan. So first of all, um, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming out to hear the poetry. Uh, we have two readings uh, still coming up this spring. The first, I can't remember what time, Saturday afternoon. This is it's part of the uh, Tucson Festival of Books, Saturday, March 12th. Oh, do you know the, do you remember the time, Charles? Uh, March 12th, I think it's like from two to four. Okay, that's great. And the two readers are Marat uh, Nemet Najat and our own uh, David Weiss in the Kiva Room at the Student Union at University of Arizona. So that's going to be live and in person. And then uh, probably back on Zoom, but we'll see how the pandemic is going. Uh, Saturday, uh, April 23rd at 6 uh, p.m. Mountain Time, uh, George Quasha and Andrew Perioli. And that'll be our program for, for this spring. Uh, we'll be we'll be back in fall. We hope we'll be back live. So uh, here come the the lots of uh, acknowledgments of support. So first of all, uh, we're grateful to acknowledge the support of uh, associated with the uh, Arizona Commission on the Arts, both AZ CARES grants and AZ organizational relief grants, and also uh, poets and writers. And then for long term support, uh, going back to when we were live and in person. Uh, WAMO and Jim Wilcox for hosting our events, the University of Arizona Poetry Center, Chax Press, the University of Arizona English Department, and the journal Arizona Quarterly. Uh, we also want to thank our various individual donors. And uh, you can become a donor, uh, you can become a patron uh, by uh, donating $100, and that entitles you to two admissions, uh, either live or with no feeling that you ought to uh, Give us a donation for individual readings if you do that, or for fifty dollars you can become a, a sponsor. Uh, you should be able to find those donating links on the Pog website, or you could email any of us. So, uh, the Pog patrons are Charles Alexander, Mary Ellen Bartholomew, Charles Bernstein, Cynthia Hogue, Jason Lagapa, Joan Larkin, Judith Lefebvre, Cameron Louis, Lisa Martin, Eric Matchett, John Melillo, Cynthia Miller, Kenny Nathanson. Oracle Retreat for Writers, Nancy Quigg, Stephen Romaniello, Stephen Salmoni, Will Stanier, Richard Havener, and David Weiss. And our sponsors are Karen Brennan, Elizabeth Brown, Reed Dixon, Lynn Finger, Maggie Golston, Barbara Henning, Jean Huving, Larkin Higgins, Beth Joslow, Anna Lambert, Little Red Leaves, Susan Lewis, Richard Lice, Heidi McDonald, Barbara Miller, Laura Mullen, Jason Jameson Nunix, Jenna Osman, Propolis Press, Anthony Sobek, Mariah Starr, Cole Swenson, Susan Thackeray, Barbara Tomash, and Michelle Worthington. Uh, we intend this to be a safe space. Uh, so if you feel virtually made uncomfortable or virtually made really uncomfortable, uh, please uh, reach out um, either in the chat or email or text or something like that. Uh, to any of the POG board members. So if you're a member of the POG board, would you raise a paw, please? And then finally, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we call home. Tucson, where POG is based, is the ancestral home of the Tonoatum and Pascoyaki nations. Please take this moment to reflect on how, in the wake of a history of violence and dispossession, we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. All right, Charles, over, over to you. And again, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Um, if I could add just one note of news, one of our POG board members who couldn't be here tonight, uh, David Weiss has a brand new book, his first book out from Chax Press titled In Memoriam in Enquiry. So look for that. Jeffrey Higgins is a poet and a film and video maker. He has MFA degrees in both of those fields, one from Illinois State University and one from the California Institute of Arts. And he lives in Hyrule, California, which I just found out today is uh, a word that in um, India, 
is used to describe elephants. So whether uh, Jeffrey's going to show you a video of him riding an elephant, I, I don't think that's the case, but, um, but maybe that happened in that part of California. I had the pleasure of knowing uh, Jeffrey Higgins for a few years in South Texas when we uh, shared experiences at the University of Houston, Victoria, including um, one of my most pleasant experiences there, which were hours back and forth to New Orleans with him for the New Orleans Poetry Festival. Uh, all I knew, I think, about Jeffrey when I asked him to go to New Orleans with me was that he was a poet and he had a kind of mind that engaged with the world like a poet, very curious and very sharp. But I didn't know what he was going to sound like in his poems until I heard him on a stage. And I tell you, I was blown away. There is a both a an engaging smartness a little bit of a critical look at the world and a sense of humor. And when I think of that intelligence mixed with humor and a little critique, I mean, that is qualities in poetry that go back to um, Sappho and Horace, you know, and it's been part of poetry forever in every culture. And I think that uh, Jeffrey is one of those voices that is important to us right now. His first chapbook was titled, you know, I think things are tough everywhere. And that was published in 2019 before the pandemic began. So it was prescient as well. So please, um, with me, welcome a multidisciplinary artist and multidisciplinary mind, Jeffrey Higgins. Thank you, Charles. That's very kind. Um, today is a mixture of um, sound poetry and video. And what I've done is I work in both, uh, you know, both with poetry, mostly through performance poetry. And, but also I do print poetry. I have a chat book. Things are tough all over, which was actually even earlier than that. It was 2014. Oh, so it's, it's, it's we're going way back. That's uh that's, that's pre Trump. Uh, that's uh Yeah. Good Lord. Um, so uh, what I have for tonight is a new piece that I've prepared specifically for this event. Um, it's called uh, uh, Perform Acne Anxiety 7 uh, Fragments of a Letter to Sam. And it begins the first, it's in three parts. And um, the first two parts are video. The third part is uh, a poem that I've written and will perform after the video is through, but don't necessarily think of them as uh, the, 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 the poetry, the sound poetry is being in any way sequential. It doesn't necessarily come after the video, but it doesn't necessarily come alongside the video. Also, there's a reason I'm not reading it along with the video and the video is silent. It's about 11 minutes long. Um, in the tradition of, uh, you know, a good experimental film, there's no soundtrack. I could have done an imposing soundtrack, but I neglected instead to let the images speak. And the whole thing uh, comes as a kind of a, a diaristic uh, uh, look into this into this moment. So um, if we could start with the, the video and, you know, just let yourself listen to the, the sounds that you're hearing normally through your everyday, through your life right now as you watch the video. And that will be the soundtrack. Um,
this part is silent, just so everyone knows.
three. This visit, is it postcard or poltergeist? This red is the color of money, of sitting in state. Is it haunted or is it playing dead? Is it plain? Over the kitchen sink, there's deja vu. The white wall and the hills beyond it leave their echoes in the eye. They wander in red or in blue across the frame. Remember this? Frames of reference. The door is a neighbor's sleeping window, a light spread neatly across itself, a glimpse of things standing. Krakauer's grave is deeper than you'd think. Even the maps have no territory. I don't follow roads, I follow instructions. Streets become coordinates and the thing is further obscured. Another minor or major difference in perception, I'd say. A driver is a carrier of food or of distance. And the voice that carries me through the night roads replaces memory or slides beneath it to pry open an exploitable gap. Between the thing and the thing seen, there is a voice. The voice that carries you is strong and is weak. The voice that carries you inside you is owned, is not you nor I. None of us that we are, that we are become used up, see. Mind yields a wild scent, screams and lets loose the room. The river is low despite the rain, despite the winter and clouds at the window. The winter is a trickle. We see it spitting up rocks and cement buildings. Tomorrow we know is up. On the radio, on the internet, on the television screen, the faucet is running flammable liquid and the dairies are all low on blood. The futures, I'm told, are dying in poverty. Feet never even touched the ground. The car does all the legwork. The landscape is replaced by its features, names of canyon roads, parks, eateries, and supermarkets. The landscape is a chain of mail, and I am providing an inventory, an independent contractor. What do I know of place anyway? If we get lucky, she said, maybe it will end in a draw. Better luck next time. Remember them standing between two rows of night, blanket stare, and you said, four hours of playing around with words yields so much meatless fruit. Just toss it already. Well, better than puttering around canyon roads. Better than looking up house numbers in the dark. Better than falling over. Better than these highways with this mileage. Keeps the food warm, you know, keeps the belly swollen. Before we killed the sun, we took samples of its light. We stored pieces of it away in the dark so we could review them later. We took care to preserve an image of the dead sun. Now we've replaced the unfolding matter with a sensor to track and to carefully mimic the scene of the scene, leaving us with ghosts in the memory of light. In place of ontology, we shrouded desire and called it a market. The sun is replaced by its double. The digital window is opened and closed. Same mirrors scream. There is writing on the outside table. On the outside table, there is light. You can cut up the mail to write a screenplay, but you can't sell it very easily. Now that's Hollywood. All right. I'm going to do one more very short poem from the chat book uh, called Dear Jack, which is a letter both to Jack Spicer, the poet, and to my cat, whose name is Jack. <coughs> And I would originally perform this with a hacked radio 
do what they call a laying of hands where you sort of fiddle with it and it makes these strange sounds, but I don't have a radio to play. So instead I'm just gonna read it. Um, but you can imagine whatever static you wish as I read. Dear Jack, an audience is sound. Stay clear of walls and mere images. The outside is a named thing, emphatic thing, hard shadow body if only we knew how, collage of material made wow. Low goes the fovea face up you uneasy bodies. An image jack is a Frankenstein radio parasite in the brain. A poem is an Illinois house ship through which a wander is a further derangement of furniture. What footsteps surprise us? We dead talk too, but not always so freely. The poem then an accident landscape and body dragging its own mirror image. You will exhaust the language before you even see the thing Jack will reach out and ride you clear to Cairo. Yes, it will turn you to stone. I too would like to make a poem of real objects. And when you conjure mirrors, they allow for every possible reflection. Poetry from below, some strange stage between mirror and music. The camera eye perfects, the human eye loses focus, and the mirror is staged, Jack, arranged as rain in a mise en abyme. Outside, confusion of insides, intensity of insides, themselves an expression of out. Non-identity then dwells in denied openings, invisible fields drink the drainage seeping through these mid-wetlands. Spiritualism, a woman's side to harness the invisible work against suffering. Complicated gesture of empathy, of capital labor, of smoke and bone, lost in the bone, ghosts of below, launched into loneliness, static electricity, the ghost, a host, nouns, assertion, or twirl. Where we are, in the flat and unfit middle, stuck between the page made maze, a field folded in two. You enter the space of the poem and it is haunted, Jack. People are starving. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. That was terrific. It's wonderful to uh, to listen, especially to the first poem with the ghost of the video as a ghost presence for, for me the whole way through. So anyway, thanks thanks so much. And uh, Lisa's going to introduce uh, Jake Skeets. Yeah, I feel like it was about a year ago that I discovered Jake Skeet's book, Eyes Bottle Dark with a Mouthful of Flowers. As with many important discoveries, I was in a public library and I was drawn to the cover, led there, and I checked it out and read and reread it several times over the course of several weeks. The cover, a black and white Richard Avedon photo of the poet's uncle, still brings me to this very particular um, place. Uh, it sparked something inside me. Reading each poem brought still brings me to this raw edge of the world. And there are moments that deeply move me, moments of great tenderness and moments that are in this series for me of like, it feels like there's this mixture of still photos and video um, and just this expression of pain and of beauty. And it makes me think of that word exquisite because it's a word that for me is used to describe both pain and beauty in uh, kind of a deep way. I absorbed this collection for weeks and wanted to celebrate your survival, Jake, and your art, and just marvel at how you were able to bring this into the world. And then I found your words in the anthology of Native Nations Poetry that Joy Harjo edited, and the Diné Reader, which is an amazing collection of Navajo literature. I felt really fortunate to be at the reading that was done to celebrate the Diné reader's publication. And I finally got to hear you read that night along with an incredible slate of readers. So that's when I started buying multiple copies of your book and giving those to board members here and friends and saying, read this. Can we ask him to read for us? 
So thankfully you are here. And I want to say welcome. Um, Jake Skeets teaches at Diné College in Salie, Arizona, and is very active in the poetry community. So also look forward to hearing about what you're working on with other writers. And thanks for sharing your powerful pieces with us tonight. We're honored to have the opportunity to share you and your work with a new audience tonight and beyond this evening when people find this on YouTube. So welcome, Jake Skeets. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yat a she Matthew Jake Skeets in and she sinah jinin the shlin to behind bushes chin Hello, everybody. My name is Jake, and I'm coming to you from Salie, Arizona, where I teach here at Danette College. And it's kind of like a bittersweet moment because I'm actually in the process of moving from Salie to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And that's which is probably why you're hearing like an echo, because I'm coming to you from a very empty room. But to help out... Um, with the sound, I sort of covered my desk with all these different books that I had stuffed in my bag. It's working. Um, okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I sort good. of like have all these different blankets hanging hanging around me, plus some cardboard boxes um, that we were moving with. So hopefully that helps with the sound. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Lisa. Um, definitely do appreciate it. It's a uh, it's really an honor whenever I'm invited anywhere. I feel I feel very humbled when people um, sort of feel a spark in the in the work that's really what i was hoping for right that's really what i could only hope for as a as a poet for my readers that they are inspired or moved in some big or small way um so that's definitely very good to hear um so tonight i'm going to read for you all some new work plus work from uh the book eyes bottle dark and then i'll end with new work um so it'll be new the book and then new work, just so you get a sort of a range of, 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 of me as a poet. Um, but just some background information real quick. I'm from, I'm, I'm Diné. Uh, I'm from Van Wagen, New Mexico. Um, I've been teaching here at Diné College for a few years now. So it's, uh, but I'm actually in transition to a new position at the University of Oklahoma. Um, so I'm really excited for that new chapter, but I'm also really sad to be leaving uh, Diné uh, I feel like I've been sort of, I've grown so much as a poet here in Salie, here in Arizona, um, but I'm ready to sort of move out into the world and see what happens. Um, and to get it sort of the growth or sort of like the range, this, this is all new work here um, that I'm going to share with you all. So this first one is called Opening Light, and I wrote it in response to uh, Gallup, New Mexico, where I'm from, one of my hometowns, um, has an art gallery called Gallup or Arts One Two Three, and they reached out to uh, several Diné poets to write a poem that a Diné artist would then sort of recreate um, using their particular art medium. And so I wrote this poem for that project. And just a few days ago, I saw the finished piece that the, an artist had created named Aaron Benali. And he had done such an amazing job capturing this poem in a painting. It was exactly what I was envisioning when I wrote it. Um, and so I'm glad we were able to have that sort of connection and we were able to have just a brief conversation about, um, I guess, the aesthetics and what it means to be a Diné artist um, here in, 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 in these lands. Uh, so this one's called Opening Light. And it actually, I believe is, is going to be opening my new collection of work. Opening light. Gravity is God deep felt, but impossible to see. What might be true? What joy? Two birds rigged to cloud, lake shimmer, wind kept in dust fog. There are monsters sometimes still deep inside people. Opening lights in the afternoon thundering through. Red brown water. Horses probably still there. 
say this is a step into silence toward beauty and beauty and everlasting. The air, the color of canyon peach, an open field rainlit in the morning. And this next one is called The Morning Ends. And when I was a young poet, um, I came across Joy Harjo's um, reading that she did for, uh, I think it's Deaf Poetry Jam. It was a show back on HBO back, back in the day, apparently. And I came across her reading. Um, and I, I was just so moved to sort of see Native American poet sort of see and sort of witness sort of the rhythm. And then, of course, a few years later, I would actually meet Joy at Frontier Restaurant in Albuquerque. Um, she sort of actually invited me and we had lunch together, me, this random person. And she you know, opened her arms, opened her, me up to her family and said, hey, you know, come eat with us. Let's talk a little bit. And that was probably the biggest gift that Joy gave me, aside from, you know, inviting me to do the anthology and doing all these different things recently. Um, so this is kind of like my um, my, I guess, tribute or borrowing some of Joy Joy's light in, in sort of this sort of pandemic, I feel like. It's called The Morning Ends. I release you. The distance between us sung from pole to lung, forelock to mulch, syllable to wither, peak to main. It's snow gathered into ice. I release you, the morning's cessation or half-life tamp to sod, molded into a specter of a horse, shrubland, twig beetle, scrub jay, deer caught in barbed wire, evening red light. My heart, my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart. <clears throat> and I'll go ahead and switch to the book now, Eyes Bottle Dark, with a mouthful of flowers. So this one's called Let There Be Coal, and it takes place in Winder Rock, Arizona, which is the capital of the Navajo Nation. I spent some time there when I was a teenager and also lived there when I first moved back to the reservation, where, where majority of this book was sort of written and forged. And of course, I mentioned Gallup as well, and that's one of my hometowns. Let there be coal. One, a father hands a sledgehammer to two boys outside Window Rock. The older goes first, rams a rail spike into the core, it sparks. No light comes, just dust cloud, glitter black. The boys load the coal. Inside them, a generator station opens its eye. A father sips coal slurry from a styrofoam cup, careful not to burn. Two, train tracks and mines split gallop into. Men spit coal, tracks rise like a spine when drunk town kneels to the east. Three, Spider Woman cries her stories coiled in warp and wool, the rug now hung in a San Francisco or Swedish hotel. We bring in the coal that dyes our hands black, not like ash, but like the thing that makes a black sheep black. Four, this is a retelling of the creation story where Navajo people journeyed four worlds and God declared, let there be coal. Some Navajo people say there are actually five worlds. Some say six. A boy busting up coal in Winder Rock asks his dad, when do we leave for the next one? His dad sits his coffee down to hit the boy. Coal doesn't bust itself. 
<clears throat> and this one is called Mar. Buffalo burr veins around siltstone, mounds on the monocline. Flow rock smooths over into ore, cut leaf cornflower overgrown pollen blown out. Larkspur and bee plant on the meadow. Grasp at the basement fault, tot atop diatreme. Bulb liquid overflows into grasses, yellow sheen in the winds. Lacolith ghost shadows over hungry dust. Rains chew down medicine twigs. Blue flax left as moans that foam into the sky. Numb star erect over the horizon. Burning bomb quiet as stone. And this one is called Drifter. And that is the, the poem that sort of responds to the cover of the collection. And for those who may not be aware, just to repeat from Lisa's story, the, the cover of my, my first book is a Richard Avedon portrait that was taken in 1979. And, this, and the person there is actually my uncle, Benson James. Um, and it was taken during the summer when Rich Dravidon was doing his In the American West book. Um, and But a year later in 1980, Benson was actually murdered in Gallup, um, which is not a unique story in, in any sense. Um, but when I first heard about this, I was a very young child, didn't really understand um, the gravity of the situation, didn't understand the gravity of that particular narrative, nor the gravity of this photograph. But it was coming back as, you know, after having gone through college, finally coming back home um, during the writing of this book, actually, that I sort of this photo came into new meaning where I could sort of see it almost as a mirror um, where I could see myself in that portrait, where I could see my cousins in that portrait. And that was sort of what rattled me a little bit. And I feel like. Brandon Shimoda um, talks about this a lot uh, in, in, in The Grave on the Wall, right, where he comes across the photograph of his of his uh, grandfather in the Japanese internment camps, right, and, the, and that feeling that Brandon has of this innate connection that you have, this sort of ancestral memory um, that's conjured by a simple photograph is what I felt as well. I, I never met um, Benson, of course. But I heard many stories about him when I was growing up from my mother. Um, but just seeing the photograph, I already felt this sort of like familiarity that there was this sort of sense of, um, you know, connection in some bigger, small way. And so this is my, my way of sort of speaking to him uh, through, through the book and, and, and trying to reach out as much as I could. Drifter. After Benson James Drifter, Route 66, Gallup, New Mexico, June 30th, 1979, by Richard Avedon. Drift. To drift is to be carried by a current of air or water, but men are not the teeth of their verbs. They pry nouns open with a belt buckle to take a sip. Drifter, a drifter carried by a current of air or water, makes his way from one place to another. See vagabond, see transient, see drunk, see a man with shoulder length hair, dollar bills fisted, standing before a white screen. See his lips, how still, how horizon. How sunset, a train passing through. I tried to hug him through the spine. Left on the white space, his face becomes a mirror if I stare long enough. My face, charcoaled, 
pursed, squinting at the camera. Train horn, punch shatters the mirror, frees him from the page. My uncle leaps from the And I'll read two more for you, and then I'll go ahead and end it. So this is the last poem in the book. And it was, and again, I always try to say this, it's sort of like my reclamation of beauty, reclamation of, of, of light, of trying to let it sort of settle, the dust settle after sort of like all the, the grief work of, of going through Eyes Bottle Dark. This was sort of like my leaping off point um, in the fields with lines from D.A. Powell, we unyoke owl pellets from marrow in desert meadow, his mouth a pigeon eye, a torch, a womb turned flower. He, still a boy, dug from cactus skull, undresses into bark beetles. He unlearns how to hold a fist with my hand, bursts into dandelion seeds. We all are beautiful at least once. Mud water puddles along enamel, eye teeth blossom into osprey, our bones dampen like snow melt under squirrel grass. We could be boys together finally as milk vetch, tumbleweed and sticker bush. We can be beautiful again beneath the sumac, yarrow and bitter water. All right, and I'll go ahead and move on to um, newer work, a new work for you. Um, so this one I wrote in response to Museum of Modern Art asked me to write um, a poem in response to Sky Hopinka's, a Sky Hopinka piece. Um, and in the film, if you can imagine it, there's all these instances of, of sort of like a dark sky with all these lights sort of dancing um, within, throughout the film, intermixed with um, the, the, the poet Diane Burns, who's sort of reading some of her work. Um, and it was sort of, the film was a tribute to Diane Burns. And so this is my tribute to Sky Hopinka, to Sky Hopinka's tribute to Diane Burns. So there's like a layer of translation there happening. But what I was most captured by in the film was this light, uh, this light dancing. And because the first book for my for me was such a long work in 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 understanding grief and understanding the gravity of of history and and the kind of pull it can have on uh, who we are as people, um, I wanted this I want this next book um, to sort of focus on the morning after. Right, the the morning after like a long ceremony, um, the morning after you have a really hard night, but you say, you know, this is a new day. This is what I'm going to be living for, um, and so I think that's that's where I'm sort of seeing this book heading, and I feel like all these new poems are are moving toward that direction as well, and I think it's needed, especially after a long pandemic. Right, um, sort of how do we move through? Uh, how do we reach that other side if there is one? Um, so this one is called, and I'll end with this one. It's called On Rain or Light or Joy. Yes, I made it rain. At the horizon, a broom or broom of light. This is the rain for which we kneel to someone who came back from the dead. So yes, I made it rain. I am here alive. So yes, the rain comes through me and only me every night, in fact. The rain is a story of survival. So once it stops, so do I and so do you. But for now, take my hand lapping at the evening. The light is raining. Through accordion light, the shadows of ghosts of ghosts. Through accordion light, an altar of or altar to windmills mourning. Through accordion light, the absence of it. Through accordion light, a sentence sentencing. 
This is my face, a liquor of light, a lacquer of it. This is my face, an entire song of it. Go, my son, go and climb the ladder. Go, my son, go and earn your feather. Go, my son, make your people proud of you. This is my body, loam, pond quiet, text contorted into a crane on water, a sinew of light attached to another and to another and to beyond and has been and ever after. But for now, the wind crumbles into drought and evenings last longer, sometimes all night. A town breathing, cactus hum, panic grass afoot, dancing, dancing, dying, dancing some more. For now, go out and dream of joy. We know the labor of feeling it. See, present joy, present joy, present joys, a murmur of it enough to fill a stadium. Take its hand, let go of mine. Hey, hey young, uh, hey, hey, young, city got a yash to tle koge ashes ne ee, yana anna opai e ee, yana anna opai e ee, yana anna opai e ee, hea hee, young niddy dash at sui, ha il cautious ne ee, yana anna opai e ee, yana anna opai e ee, yana anna opai e ee, hea hee. Young, young. Another name for mourning, another name for joy. Achia, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much, Dave. It was uh, really powerful and really beautiful, which is quite a quite a combination. So, so great, great joy to hear your work. So usually or often after our readings, we hang out a little bit for a brief conversation. And if, um, if you guys are game, uh, we'd like to do that tonight. But, so uh, it's uh, uh, this, I don't think we, we need to raise hands, just uh, unmute and uh, say something, ask something if you'd like to. Anybody? Charles, oh, can you unmute Charles? I'm unmuted. Okay, but I mean, other people. Everyone, anybody can unmute themselves. I never okay. unmute everybody. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just really enjoyed um, both of you so much, um, Jeffrey. I, you know, I. It was just so interesting with the, um, with the silent uh, video. You know, I found what I found is that when it went to that place where it was like cloth and it wasn't well defined, I was much more uncomfortable when I didn't have that the frame of reference, like even in the fog, you know, like at, at first in the fog, I thought it was hair. And then I said, oh, no, that's tree branches. Oh, that's so cool. And so but I but I had, you know, I had a, a anchors, you know, there because then I could see it was the fog. It's a tree. But yeah, when I was in the cloth and there was no, like, it made me almost like uncomfortable. And um, I just thought that, you know, that's, um, I, you know, I don't know how that ties in with fragments of the letter to Sam, but I just really was aware of that when, you know, um, when I was sitting through the video and um, then just things I really liked and that really piqued my attention. I love when you said the dairies are low on blood. I mean, so many things you said in that in that rant, but that one uh, popped out at me. And also um, uh, when you said, instead of ontology, and I'll tell you why, I, I was like, that always grabs me because I'm writing a poem about a, vi a, a series of visions I had when I was pregnant with my oldest child. And um, I call it phylogeny precedes ontology. And um, when I've 
put it up like in critique groups and stuff, like I've kind of been attacked uh, for it and um, kind of almost like what they did to Francis Crick or whatever, like, no, you're talking about mysticism and you're talking about like voodoo stuff. And, you know, it was just odd, you know, and then they were um, so, so anytime I hear that word ontology, like my ears perk up and because everybody's told me too, that I really need to dumb that down. And I resist that, you know, um, so, so I'm, I, I think I'm going to continue to resist. So I really enjoyed, um, all of that. And then Jake, I, um, absolutely loved your stuff. Um, well, it just was very, uh, I just love it. I studied anthropology six years, Native American studies. I studied at University of Alaska, Juneau, and then came down here to the Southwest to study, um, up in, uh, Northern New Mexico. Uh, and I, but I, uh, my original, uh, I originally went to New Mexico when my half Japanese daughter was born. <laughs> um, and uh, I lived in Magdalena, New Mexico, right near the Navajo dorms. I was right across the street and the Navajo kids would come over and play with my daughter. And anyways, um, so I love New Mexico. You just can't make a living there. Um, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> very difficult. Um, so that's great if you can. And I loved, um, I loved everything you did. I loved the naming of the plants and even like the the weeds, you know, just all of the plants. Cause it's like, I see those plants, but I don't know their names, you know? And I was really thinking today of the sadness of these times and trying to stay hopeful, you know, isn't that our job? Like we have to stay hopeful, bring this message of hope. But it's like the, all of the things we've lost, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, the names, you know, of the plants, we can't name them. So we don't know the medicine that's in them, you know, and, and we're relying on this greedy pill pushing industry, you know, that I don't want to rely on. I want to, I want, I used to live by back to Eden, <laughs> you know, and um. And, and try to heal with plants. And I still only take one medication today that I take for blood pressure. And I don't want to rely on things like that. So um, I so I love that. And I love so many things, but um, those are just the things I, oh, the four lock mulch, Thanks. you know, the talking about history. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that whole series that you did there, just that was amazing. That sounds great. Um, thank you, Mary. Thank you. Have, thank you, Mary. I have a question for Jake. Yes. Um, what is your approach to a phrases? Say that again. Oh, a phrases. What is your approach? Oh, oh, I see. I see. Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like it's such a. It's. I feel like it's a totally new kind of of writing. Um. I don't, because normally when I'm writing poetry um, myself, it's sort of like, you know, a lot of research, a lot of uh, looking into part particular things, the names of things, right? Um, that's generally my approach to poetry. I'm very research oriented to try and get like a full picture of, of, of the world and, and building it back up um, from the research itself. But when I go through then um, the Craxis and, 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 starting poem from from another from another piece from another vision another create creative element right it's 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 completely different and i feel like it's one that i definitely am interested in learning more about right and, and sort of venturing down further um because i've only i think i've only written, written three poems um sort of in response to other things um, well, four, four total, including the, the, the photograph one. Yeah. So I think four in total, the rest are sort of just moving about the landscape, but yeah, I love it so far. I'm really excited to learn more. Thank you. Yeah, this feels like sort of the, a version of the same question for, for both you guys, which is kind of what about your coming into relation with the ghostly, which in one way or another seems to, to really be involved in what both of you did. Well, for me, the the ghost, the, there's always a ghostliness to 
to language itself is um, just littered with ghosts and to speak is to, I feel in some way to uh, draw their attention. I don't necessarily mean this literally, but in a sense of like, like the, the history is there, the, the things that have happened are there and they, they continue to, to, to be there um, regardless of, of, of anything we may uh, think otherwise. So yeah, I think that for me that there's sort of an ever present sort of just sense that's built into language and image making as well. And any artistic practice, they're just littered with ghosts. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I like that as well. I feel like the, the, the ghostliness for me, I think is more memory, right? The, the connection we have to memory, both personal memory, but also just uh, a, com a communal type of memory an ancestral kind of memory, right? And also memory that's sort of deep within the land around us, right? That landscape holds memory. And, and I feel like that's that ghostliness, right? It's we're connected to things that are beyond us that we don't have a way to name or articulate or understand, but we can feel it. It's deep felt, right? We know what it is. We just, for some reason, can't get to that realm of, of, of languaging it. And I feel like the best way we can go about it is, is image making, is art making and, and, and moving through the world as, as creators and artists. Mm -hmm. I was interested in how both of you invoked the space of the Southwest from New Mexico to Southern California and in ways that I'm not used to it being invoked. That is, I think the stereotype is thinking of this vast space that one may transverse, but, you know, Jake, you filled up that space with life from plant life to people life. And Jeff, in, in, the, in the video, when you had the, on the road with the, the part above and part below, you take what I think of as this big space, but you sort of circumscribed it and crunched it in a way. And, and I, I, I don't know if, if I need response at all, but just I'm wondering how you relate to your own notion of those spaces and how you present them, geographical spaces and otherwise. The, the California landscape is very new for me. So, um, but also experiencing it now where it is very confining, even as it's very expansive. I think you picked up on that pretty well. Um, but yeah, I mean, landscape is always something I'm, I'm very aware of, especially, I mean, when you're making video, it's, it's there. You can't get around it unless you're animating um, or shooting indoors all the time. Um, and in poetry, it's just, it's, 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 it's just as prevalent. Um, but the California thing is, is really interesting to me because it's so new. I'm a Midwesterner, I'm from Illinois. So I'm used to very specific seasons, even though they may come at various times of year. Uh, whereas California, Southern California at least, is very, it's, it's, it's almost suffocatingly uh, beautiful. And um, then feeling a sense of confinement in other ways as well, I think that's all, it's all very much in the in the piece. Yeah, I think I think it's also important to observe, right? I feel like that's something we've we've maybe lost or forgotten how to not how to do, but just something we maybe over take advantage a little bit, right? Is observation and observing and witnessing the world around us, right? And I think Jeffrey, thank you for bringing up Jack Spicer, right? So Jack Spicer as a poet. The idea that poets are radio or antennas, right? Or like they have antennas and they're just sort of receiving all these different radio transmissions. And I feel that land offers that to us. Space offers that, right? It mm -hmm. it sends out waves, and it's our jobs as as people, as as rhythmic people with language and and movement, to figure out a way of observing and witnessing and reporting that that those transmissions. And you know, as we move through the world, you know, pandemic through the pandemic through capitalism, right? Through all those different, all those isms, right? I think knowing when it's, knowing how to listen and knowing how to observe, I think is probably one of the ways that we can get back to ourselves and, and 
reminding ourselves that we're in a really big world, that there's so much bigness around us. Um, and that's not that nothing to be afraid of, right? I think it's something to be explored and celebrated, right? That there's this endless possibility um, out there. Thanks. Well, one of the nice accidents, I guess, Jake, of you speaking to us from that empty room, and I thought of this when I was thinking about space, is the way in that last piece when you sang, it was like a reverberation. <laughs> filling that space. It was really nice. Yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah, I'm just thinking about, you know, like these these um, uh, mechanisms. I, I don't know if mechanisms are, but, but for regeneration, you know, like when you have diversity, when you have all the plants, when you have all the medicine, when you have all the, you know, uh, dances and ceremonies and and, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's like, you learn the way it has to go, you know, the order of the ritual, but there's this flexibility in there for constant reinvention, you know, and, and reformation. And, and so, um, it keeps, it keeps things a lot, uh, alive and going and constantly regenerating, you know, because the earth is that way you know, incredibly generous and, you know, um, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. It just, I'm rambling. Sorry. <laughs> Can I ask kind of a practical question, I guess. Um, so I know Jake has, Jake Skeets has the Tucson Festival books coming up. Um, so any details you might remember about like what day we can maybe find you on the schedule or um, I know how to look that up, but um, anything you could share with us about that. And then Jeffrey, if there's any opportunities coming up for people that are just getting to know your work and want to hear more, it'd be great to hear about it. Yeah, I'm really excited for Tucson. I love Tucson. I went, I was there. Uh, before, right before the pandemic, um, I visited U of A and the Poetry Center and all that good stuff and ate some really good food and sort of just witnessed the, the life there. And I was really, really in, in, in touch by the city. So yeah, Tucson Book Festival, I believe I'm part of the Diné Reader panel. And I think it's going to be myself, Sherwin, Lucy Tapahanso, Esther Boleyn, Byron Aspas, and Manning Lowley. So it's a pretty big group of the authors from the Diné Reader there. And so we're all really excited to be back um, in person, right? Um, we're all planning to sort of uh, be there and be present as much as possible. So I'm super excited. I'm not sure exactly which day, unfortunately, but it is part of the Diné Reader panel. Good. Great. Any last, oh. any last question? Or, yeah, or any, oh, oh. I'm sorry, Jeffrey, go ahead. No, please, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to plug my YouTube page. If you want to see my video work, you can yeah. go to Lefty Sniggins on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> it's a place where I mostly, well, I, 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 I upload a lot of different stuff, mostly various forms of experimental video. I'm going to start sort of edging into more video essays that are more traditional and more voice stuff, but that's mostly where I'm at now. I don't really, um, I don't have any planned publications or other readings at the moment, but I'll could be you around. Put that, could you put that in the chat for us, maybe? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah there's a chat. I yeah. just put in the chat Lefty Sniggins on YouTube. Oh, oh very Lefty good. Sniggins? Uh, okay. I'll write it again. Thank you. <laughs> and then are, is, are there another one or two questions before we call it an evening and release our poets? Kind of a question. I, I just wanted to thank Jeffrey for that. I mean, one great thing about the film or video without sound like that, it gives me this awareness of living among light, you know, and, and I, I first came into sort of experimental and independent film through, you know, what I think of as early American masters like Stan Brackage and Bruce Bailey, and in their films, it's all about light on the 
on the screen or on the cells of films. Uh, in in Bailey's case, natural light mostly, and in Brackage's, well, he does everything with light. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's... But it just makes me happy to see that. And yeah. Well, thank you. I'll have that video on YouTube also. So there's another plug. If you want to see the video um, without the extra compression and lag time of the streaming, there's the internet version, which will look a little different. It's interesting how the digital effects are added through the various transmissions, uh, whether you're streaming or if you have a file. I mean, everything, there's always the, the differences that you start to pick up on the more you start working with it. But yeah, I mean, Brackage is a great, and, and Bruce Bailey both uh, very great filmmakers. So I appreciate that. And, and Tenny, before we go, let, let's say also that Pog and Chax Press will have a presence at the Tucson Festival of Books too. We will have a booth or table somewhere out on the mall there. And uh, particularly as it looks like, you know, the cases of Omicron are still follow falling and we hope they keep falling. <laughs> but uh, it would be great to see people there. Is that a downtown thing? It's on the university campus. Oh, okay. Um, okay, good. It's partly the, the, the readings and panels and things are in various buildings nearby and the big, huge book fair and business fair, all kinds of things in tents all over the University Mall. And Tucson Festival of Books has a big website and it's searchable. You can find things that you're looking for. Yeah, cool. All right, so so thanks so much, uh, Jeffrey and, and Jake. It's a wonderful evening for Pog. You know, thanks for thanks for making it that way, and we hope everybody come back and visit us soon. And uh, when you come to Tucson, please look us up. Everybody have a wonderful night, and thanks Thank for coming guys. out to hear the poetry.